Well, some mornings you get up out of bed and you just feel like a big old hippopotamus rolling out of bed and trying to uh, get your day going. And um, today I feel pretty good. It's nice out. The sun is coming out, so that's good. Well, a week and a half uh, ago, I shared with you about the prayer of relinquishment. And um, this week I want to share with you about the prayer of lament. Lament. You know, we've been in this pandemic now for about 11 months. And during those times, I think we've all had ups and downs. Uh, there's been times I know when I've, I've quite liked uh, the slow pace of being at home. Uh, and then there's been other times when I've, I've been uh, frustrated, I've been resentful, uh, even had moments of, of um, despair where you just, is this ever going to end, right? Now, if we're honest with ourselves and with others, often we feel that God is distant. Uh, sometimes it feels like he doesn't, he doesn't hear us or he's forgotten us or at best he's slow or reluctant to act. So what does this have to do with the prayer of lament? <clears throat> I don't think Christians in the West do lament very well. Let me read you a quote from the Canadian Gospel Coalition webpage. It comes from an article enti entitled, Why Lament is Important in Worship, by a gentleman named Josh Lee. He says, in today's social media obsessed culture, Images of attractive, smiling couples, lifestyle bloggers, and stunning vacation resorts grace our glowing screens each day. The, the routine bombardment of these images implicitly and powerfully conveys what ought to be normative in life. Beauty, health, and happiness mark out today's culture. The last thing these images speak to are the countless stories of brokenness, suffering, and ultimately death that we all inevitably face. How does the contemporary church combat the veneer of optimism that this culture relentlessly bombards us with? He goes on to say, the contemporary evangelical churches and their worship are unfortunately guilty of mimicking and adopting the cultural message of an optimistic facade which screams of inauthenticity and irrelevance in a world of broken and hurt people. While the gospel story ends in an ultimate hope, we must not be hasty and skip the hurt and brokenness that accompany it. Lament, therefore, is a proper and even necessary expression of corporate worship. So it would seem this author is saying, you know, like Romans 12, 1, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It seems in this area of our lives, we've been pressed into the the mold of our culture more than we have been transformative in our culture. And why would I say that this is the way that things should be? Well, did you know roughly one third of the Psalter, of the Psalms, uh, 42 of them to be exact, are Psalms of lament or complaint. This means that lament or complaint is the most common kind of psalm. And I think this stands in stark contrast to my experience in the church for the past 30 years. In most of our worship, you'll find songs of praise, of God's unfailing love, of God's faithfulness. And those are all true, and they're, and they're all um, proper to, to be praising God and singing about the attributes of God that, that way. But there's very little about adversity, weakness, suffering, injustice, death, uh, and that's that's part of our experience here. So what is lament? Well, the, the Webster's Dictionary defines it as expressing sorrow, mourning, or regret. So let me share with you a few reasons why this sort of prayer is important, not only in our individual lives, but in our corporate lives. I got four points for you. The first one is lament intersects with reality. Lament intersects with reality. Augustine once said, It's better that the human heart should feel grief and be cured of it than by not feeling any grief and to become inhuman. What Augustine is saying is, is that through the process of articulating our lament, of expressing it, we find healing and authenticity. To do otherwise is to pretend that everything's fine, that it's all good. 
but it's good and it's healthy to face reality and to call it for what it is. And lament provides a form and a language to bring our situation before God and others. It's healthy to express our pain, our anger, our frustration, and our disappointment. That's just reality. The second is lament strengthens community. Prayers of lament should not only be expressed individually, but also corporately. Lament can become an act of solidarity with those who are suffering among us. Too often in the West, in the Western Church, um, and I, I say the West because I've, I've, I once went to a funeral of an Eastern family, and it was much different than, than what we experienced. They really expressed their lament. Um, we have kind of a British influence here where we keep a stiff upper lip. Um, but too often in the West we think in individualistic terms, I think. But the Bible tells us that we're a body, and when one part of the body hurts, so does the other. And, you know, one of the most devastating effects of this pandemic, I think, is the suffering that people are doing in isolation. Just in the past month, I've received several calls from people who just want to talk because they're, they're so lonely. There are people in our church who feel alone. Uh, they feel disconnected. They feel abandoned. And the sense of isolation is only heightened when we as a church don't give space or we minimize the suffering that another person is going through, or we don't even acknowledge it. And you know what, what kind of made me think of this solidarity piece is, you know, some of you know, uh, when I get frustrated, I turn to, to Facebook and I start venting, lamenting. And people take one or two positions. Some of them, they, uh, they uh, kind of acknowledge it and they say, yeah, I feel that way too. And others kind of see it as, as whining and complaining and I'm not saying one's one's right or the other but when it, when people really what someone's doing when they complain or when they lament is they're saying I'm I'm I don't have a, I'm not in a good place right now and uh, I I need some support and I need some prayer and I need some encouragement or I just need other people to say yeah I feel it too and it and it stinks <laughs> but when that doesn't happen, you feel kind of isolated and alone. Now, I live in a house with five people. Imagine what people who are living alone feel and where do they get to express their lament and their pain and their hurt. So this practice of communal lament helps us to build authentic community because those who are suffering realize that they're not alone. Rather, they're in a community which helps them give expression and permission to say the things that they're feeling inside. So instead of pious niceties, community is built on our real-life joys and pains, and lament becomes a way of bearing each other's burdens and proclaiming that we do not suffer alone. It's interesting, you know, Jesus was, was described as a man of sorrows. Um, you know, he, God in the flesh, uh, felt and expressed his pain uh, when, he, when he felt it. The third point is lament can lead us into mission. You know, lament is deeply connected with our place in the world. And fundamentally, lament is not about whining. Rather, it's a cry to God to establish justice and to make the world right. You know, Jesus, I think of him when he looked out at Jerusalem and he, he wept. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've desired to gather you like uh, chicks to a hen, but you wouldn't come to me. You know, at Lazarus' death, he, he wept, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus momentarily. The pain and the, just the, the devastation of, of sin and death, uh, he felt that, and he expressed it in lament. So listen again, uh, I got a quote from Walter Brueggemann, and uh, I think he says it right when he says this about lament and mission. He says, a community of faith that negates lament soon concludes that the hard issues of justice are improper questions to pose at the throne, because the throne seems to be only a place of praise. I believe that it follows that if justice questions are improper questions at the throne, they soon appear to be improper questions in public places, in schools, in hospitals, with the government, and eventually in the courts. Justice questions disappear into civility and docility. 
And we saw a little bit about the, of this last this week with, you know, one of the um, the cabinet members expressing concern over the toll that the, the pandemic has taken, and he was kicked out of cabinet. I'm not commenting on on uh, the government per se. I'm just saying that when it becomes wrong to lament, um, things can get uh, pretty pretty dicey. So corporate lament then is an act of compassion, a seeking after justice and the kingdom. Corporate lament validates the pain that someone else is feeling and the brokenness of the world as a whole. It's another way really of coming before God and saying your kingdom come, which is part of the Lord's prayer. The fourth one, the last one is lament and praise go together. They're really two sides of the same coin. And it's important to note that at the end of a psalm of lament, is a statement of praise and trust. The one lamenting may not like the current situation, but because they have experienced the faithfulness of God in the past, they're able to place their faith and trust and hope in Him for the future. And so, you know, lament without praise, and this is where it gets dangerous, can lead to self-pity and despair. But praise without lament can lead to spiritual superficiality into an inauthenticity that doesn't easily recognize or acknowledge the pain and suffering that we experience as we journey through life. So as we reflect on what COVID has taught us, I think we would do well to remember that the one of our primary missions as a church is to be a kingdom of priests. And what do priests do? They mediate between heaven and earth. Lament and praise then function together to do exactly this. They keep us, lament and praise, keep us focused on the ultimate reality of the hope we have in Christ, while simultaneously keeping the church connected to the reality of our experience on earth. And uh, I love this, I'll end with this uh, little quote. It says, praise brings heaven to earth, and lament brings earth before heaven. Isn't that great? So we need to be real, we need to feel what we really feel. We need to be able to express that and feel like we're, we're um, supported by those in the church, and it's not dismissed. Remember, I want you to keep a, a lookout for people. If you're feeling, um, you know, discouraged and you want to lament, I, I hope you feel the freedom to do that in our church family. And if you're not, if you're in a good place and you're not feeling like that, I hope that when you hear or see somebody doing that, whether it be on social media or over the phone or in person, you read those signs as a sign of an opportunity to minister to that person, to pray for them, and uh, to come alongside them, and not to chastise them. Um, I want to end today with a psalm of lament in Psalm 13. And I'm going to change it a little bit. I'm going to make it uh, plural uh, for all of us, and I'm also going to contextualize it uh, a little bit. But before I do that, I want to get into our um, day 11 of January 21st. I've so much enjoyed this prayer calendar. And uh, the scripture promise today is James 4, very relevant to the topic. I didn't, I didn't even plan this, but it happened nonetheless, as God often does. So it's James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. One of the, day, one of the ways that we draw near to God is, is through our, our prayers and our lamenting prayers. So we want to pray for uh, these, these times of confinement at home, um, that people would draw near to God and God would draw near to them. Uh, we want to pray that these times of drawing near, near will reveal to us much about the character and greatness of God, and uh, that we individually and corporately would, would experience God drawing near to us. So let me end with this prayer of lament, Psalm 13, and then we will go to prayer. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from us? How long must we wrestle with our thoughts and day after day have sorrow in our hearts? How long will COVID triumph over us? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love, and my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. You see how the lament is followed by a statement of praise and trust and faithfulness. And so I, I pray today that we would lament well, but we would ultimately 
cling on to the hope that we have in Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of authenticity and uh, you invite our complaints and our, our laments. Uh, but you don't leave us there. You have given us hope in Jesus, hope in uh, one day this world will be made right. And so we thank you and we praise you for that. And Lord, we pray that through our prayers, our prayers of lament, our prayers of relinquishment, our prayers of, of praise, that we would draw near to you and that you would draw near to us. And we ask as we do this, Lord, that you would reveal things about yourself to us and you'd reveal things about us to us and help us to change those things, uh, character deficits. And uh, Lord, we pray as a whole family that we would experience your closeness and we would stand in solidarity with those who are lamenting. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day and God bless.